It's good to see you here today. Um, I know we've got some wonderful things that God has in store for us. It's been a, a really sweet week of prayer and preparation to uh, be in the Word, to be preparing to preach this morning. It's a high privilege to do that. It's a joy to, to be here with you today. And I encourage you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to the letter of Ephesians. Uh, we're in chapter 2 today. And we will be moving into verse 4 and 5. I want to read to you verse 1 through 3 to help set the table and remind us of where we've been, what Paul has said up to this point. For it is critical to see the bad news before we turn to the good news. The uh, verse 1 through 3 very much sets up the beauty and the power of what Paul is about to say. Consider with me the opening words of chapter 2. Paul says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. This is a sobering description for all of us who are apart from Christ in sin under Adam because of the fall. Um, Things that we've studied desperate for a Savior. To recap quickly, Paul says clearly that those apart from Christ, because of our sin, we're dead in sin. We're not just sick. We're not able to climb out on our own with hard work. The world will tell you just to work hard, to change your circumstances. While that might work to change some of your practical circumstances, it will not work to change your eternal standing before the Holy God. We're dead. We're needing to be revived given, quickened for spiritual life. The only one who can do this is God. He says clearly that we're walking or, or we're practicing sin. In other words, those who are dead in sin are enslaved to only sin. That even the good that a person who is apart from Christ seems to do is still sin because the aim of that good thing is not to the glory of God. It still has a sinful aim or motivation says that we are committed to following the course of the fallen world. We'll justify our actions because they look like others and, and we'll look to others and fallen people and fallen cultures to, to, to shape us and to define us. Our priorities are not of God, they're of the world, apart from Christ. Apart from Christ, dead in our sin, we are following or devoted to the devil. We belong to Adam, our federal head. We are... Guilty in our sin, we're devoted to doing things that honor the devil. We don't do what honors God. He says that we're sons of disobedience. That that our our very will, our our power to obey God's law is is bound. We're, We're bound in sin, and so all we do is disobey says that we're living in the passions of the flesh. Trying to be satisfied with, with our fleshly lust or fleshly desires or our over-desires, even for good things. There's an over-desire. We talked about this this last week. Instead of being satisfied in God. It says that we're carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. That, that our mind, our, our bodies are, are, are bound in sin and, and they're fallen, and so they're self-seeking. We talked last week about that we, we should not listen to our hearts. Not, we should not just follow our hearts. Our hearts are deceived in our sin, in our, in our state, uh, our condition, apart from Christ, apart from salvation. He says that we're by nature children of wrath. Our fallen nature, the reality of the curse, is that God's general wrath is on us, the curse, the curse is on mankind, 
and that because of our sin, we deserve His eternal wrath. This is the sad and sobering and damning diagnosis of the nature of fallen man. Dead in sin, enslaved to the will of the flesh, deserving God's righteous and eternal wrath. But remember, remember the good news that at the opening words of this section, Paul says, in writing to Christian brothers and sisters, he says, you were. And then in verse 3, he says, we all once were. Past tense, showing that he's describing the Christian's former condition. And therefore, Paul's about to speak with great clarity about how and why we are saved and set free from our former state to be made alive in Christ Jesus. Today, we turn to the good news, church, the gospel of our Lord. May it be refreshing, may it be motivating. For we are saved in Christ, made new. And may it it truly be changing, life-changing in the greatest way for those who are yet to be saved, that you would know God's grace, you would know new birth and faith in Jesus alone. Look with me now as Paul turns in verse 4 and 5, the focus of our sermon today. He says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. But God is the answer. God alone. Not us. He he didn't say here's how we turned ourselves around. What's so amazing when we consider our absolute deplorable depravity and condition when we see it rightly, when we see it fully, we see that we deserve judgment. We deserve wrath. And we see that our salvation is is not a doing or a turning of our own, but of God alone. It could not be done by us. We could not save ourselves. Why? Because we were spiritually dead. Dead people don't resurrect themselves unless their name is Jesus Christ, unless they are God the Son. Also notice that it's not others who saved us. No one else saved us, for they could not offer what was necessary. They could not do what was needed to revive us, to remove our guilt and sin. No, only God could. And the good news is that while God would have been 100% right, just to wipe us all out, to convict and condemn every one of us in our sin, He chose not to. Instead of righteous wrath to be poured out on all who deserve it, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit from eternity past chose in love to pour out mercy on many of us undeserving sinners because that wrath would be righteously and rightly poured out on Christ in our place. But God, not ourselves, not others, but God. These words need to knock us over, church. How absolutely dead and utterly desperate we are in our sin for the only one who could save us, who could deliver us. And he chose to, and he did it. The story of mankind should equal all of us drowning in our sin, in our despair, slipping away in our ruin and consumed by our enemies. Enemies from, in the form of other people, in the form of lies and deception of the flesh, in the form of mental sorrow or physical sickness. I want us to feel the weight of our condition. This is Paul's aim in these early verses of chapter 2, that we see that he owes us nothing, that we see ourselves in our sin rightly. When God gives you eyes to see and ears to hear, when He awakens you, gives you spiritual new birth, one of the great gifts that come in the earliest parts of that awakening is you start to see your sin rightly, fully. And in the midst of that, you see your desperation for Jesus alone to save you. The 
There's only one who could save us. The story only changes for you. You only have hope if God chooses to act upon, to quicken, to make us new. I'm here to tell you that this is exactly what He has chosen to do for many. For many, at the brink of ruin, the reality of no hope, our story includes the sweetest words of transition in the narrative of our deplorable story. Those two sweet words. But God, I want us to hear how God has moved in others. I I want you to hear from those that God has ordained to testify of this in Holy Scripture. As we look back to the Psalms, we see David speak of this. Consider David, guilty of adultery, murder, and sinful, selfish acts. But God had salvation for David. David, who had innumerable enemies, real-life hardships, even facing the death of a child, real consequences for his sinful actions, but God had a purpose for David. Listen how David testifies of this in a few places in the psalm. First Psalm 41, 5-13. through 13. My enemies say of me, In malice, when will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. Do you just see his his whole world exposures is collapsing on him the testimony of those just against him it just is there any hope amidst all of this coming at me feel the weight of that and in, in what he's saying when one comes to see me he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity when he goes out he tells it abroad All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say a deadly thing is poured out on them and he will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me and my enemy will not shout and triumph over me. Or, or, or Psalm 102. Look at Psalm 102 with me in verse 3 through 28. For my days pass away like smoke and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl in the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I'm like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the, all the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. I eat ashes like bread. I mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an empty shadow. I am, I wither away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will rise and have pity on Zion. It is time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Nation, nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despair their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. 
that he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise when peoples gather together and kingdoms worship the Lord. He has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days. You whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old you lay the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Despair. Enemies coming on every side. Days, tears in the drink. Food like ashes. Nothing's going well but God. Glory, hope, future. Or Psalm 130. So overwhelmed with his sin. He, he sees, he realizes who could ever stand before the Holy God. Listen, Psalm 130, verse 3 through 8. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And in the midst of that deep bucket of guilt and shame and deserved wrath, because who could stand in the in the presence of the Holy God, what does He say? But with you there is forgiveness. That you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with Him is plentiful redemption. And He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. The this, this story unfolding, the news you need to hear is that we deserve His condemnation and wrath, but His plan from before time was to save a people, and He is doing that. But God, see the turn in the story and rejoice with me for its good news of hope, of new beginnings, of life eternally with God. See how rich He is in His mercy. Look back at the text with me. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, being rich in mercy. God, You chose to save. This is truly good news, especially when we understand His many attributes. That He is good. God is good. God is love. God is wrath. God is just. God is holy. God is jealous. God is mercy. God is all-powerful. I could go on and on. We must see that all of God's attributes are perfectly and completely who He is. God is not one of His holy attributes more than another. It is God's sovereign and free right to apply His attributes to His creation so He pleases and wills. This is Paul's vital and clear point made in Romans chapter 9. Consider verse 18 through 23 with me. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whoever he wills. You will say to me, Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath 
and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory. God has every right to save none or some in mercy. His every right to condemn or harden in his wrath. It is only in our sin, it is only in our selfishness and pride that we would contend it is not God's total right to do with His creation as He wills, to exercise His attributes as He wills, but that we would be so arrogant to declare to Him, no, this should happen differently. In my definition of good or loving or whatever, I will say that it should look like this. This is arrogance, a sin. Paul reminds his listeners, who are you, O man, <laughs> to, to tell the Creator what to do with the creation? So hear me clearly this morning. God's mercy is His to give, and it is not ours to demand. He is good despite how our lives go. He's good all the time. Because He's good. Are you guilty of only saying God is good when it's going good? Because it is absolutely as true when it's all going south. He's good. And His love and His wrath are equally His perfect attribute. One's not more important than the other, bigger or better than the other. Both are perfectly God. When we get this, then we begin to see that our sin rightly deserves wrath. And our position changes from an ignorant, prideful, fleshly position that says, why doesn't he just save everyone? To utter amazement that he chooses to save anyone. In, in one view, I think really highly of man, I think really low of God, that he should, just, he should do this thing that I want him to do. In another view, I see sin and what it deserves rightly and fully, and then I am amazed that God applies his mercy to that which deserves wrath to save anyone. God owes us nothing but righteous justice as the penalty for our sin. The fact that God gives mercy is rich. Just the fact that He does it. If you see rightly the depth of the sin, the, the wickedness that He overcomes to give that mercy. Why is His mercy so rich? Think about it. The measure of the richness of His mercy is due to the depth of the reach of that mercy when applied to dead sinners who have nothing good to offer and lots of wickedness to overcome. The fact that His mercy is applied to any of us means, watch this, it is very, very rich. <laughs> He's rich in mercy. But God, being rich in mercy, just finally have a view of this whole culture of people, mankind, deplorable, depraved, dead in sin. And now the narrative is unfolding that God ordains to be rich in mercy. It just should knock us over. So 
solely God's free will to choose to apply His mercy and love to His people, to His elect people. Romans 9.16 says so clearly, salvation depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. God was not inspired by us, church. (laughs) Quite the opposite. It was His mercy, it was His love with which He loved us before time. This is what Paul is saying. Nothing in us, nothing performed by us. You need to understand that this is an eternal love for definite individual objects of His choosing before time. He's unchanging. It is the eternal love of God that He's always had for His elect. This is what Paul made very clear. We studied this in great detail months ago as we worked through Ephesians chapter 1, 4-6. through 6. Let me read it again. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be a holy and, and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. We we have to correct our modern or fleshly misguided narratives that say mankind is able to freely choose our own destiny and God's hand is tied to submit to that choice. This is not the teaching of Holy Scripture. It is a misguided, deceived idea of fallen man. While we do make choices every day, all day, our choices, when bound in sin, are sin. We must be quickened, made alive by God, if we are ever to say yes to the Gospel. Also, Scripture teaches us in this doctrine of election, before time, before anyone was born, God destined and chose whom He would love. Those created as vessels or recipients of His mercy prepared for glory. And God destined and chose whom He would hate. Those created as vessels or recipients of His wrath prepared for destruction. You say, wow, pastor, that's, that, that's serious. Where are you getting that? Well, right here. Look, Romans 9, 11-13. Ephesians 1 that we just did, read, In love He predestined those whom He chose. Romans 9, 11-13. Paul's describing this. He, he, he's going back and he's showing the story. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Does God choose because He sees the future choice? No. God's outside of time. He wants His purpose of election to be seen, praised. We've talked about this. They've done nothing good or bad, not because of works, not because He sees that they're going to do something good. It's not because of their works, but because of Him who calls. She was told the older will very uniquely serve the younger. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. When we understand the sovereignty of God rightly in salvation and rightly understand His attributes, we understand, now watch this, that God's eternal wrath was never on the elect. While we experience His general wrath and separation from Him rightly because we are conceived in sin and live in sin, We are on the enemy's team, 
acting like enemies, fighting for the enemy, doing nothing under the glory of God. Scripture teaches us that God loved us, His people, while He sees us on the other team. What you have to see is that God doesn't change in our salvation. We do. God doesn't change. We were always objects of mercy prepared for glory. We were never objects of wrath prepared for destruction. We were worthy of wrath while dead in our sin. The blood of Christ applied to us means salvation. God's eternal and perfect love was always on us the entire time. We are conceived in sin. We played for the other team until we're saved. God always knew, continues to know, when and of whom of us He will save and bring near. This is not shifting. It's not changing. It's not in concert with our actions or our performances. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So when we read, because of the great love with which He loved us, it is a very special and definite love He has had for individual people of His eternal choosing. Paul is saying to his listeners, understand, you were this thing in the fall. You were doing these things as opposed to the glory of God. But God had a love for you from before time, set on you, purposed you for salvation, and you are His. Know that that is His love for you. This is good news. Good news to our souls. The amazing love of God at work in the most amazing and gracious way. Hear it again. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Even when we were in that deplorable state, deserving of wrath, nothing for His glory. He made us alive together with Christ. This is such an important declaration of truth that we see throughout Holy Scripture that we contribute nothing to our salvation. We were dead. We were desperate for the record of another to be completely applied to us. We had nothing to offer. We put nothing on the table dead in our trespasses, ungodly sinners opposed to God, at war with His holiness and glory, living out our lives for our own glory. We pursued our own glory, making war with the one true God. His enemies, deserving His righteous wrath. But while we were actively against Him, He loved us and planned to make us together with Christ. Hear Ephesians 1, 4-6 again. Let it wash over you. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. He saw His plan through to make us alive together with Christ. The with here is is getting to the imputation that we need in Christ. All the time that we spent for weeks looking at original sin and, and Adam's imputed guilt on us. Some of you are getting really tired of all that. Don't get tired with the, with the economy of imputation because it is by that very economy that we are made alive in Christ. His record laid upon us. For in Adam all die, so also Those in Christ shall all be made alive. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus takes on our death. In exchange, He gives us His life. He takes on our sin. In exchange, He gives us His righteousness. This is the good news of the second Adam. 
anyone who is saved is, is saved because of the record of another, of Jesus, of his perfection. In Adam all die, those in Christ shall may be made alive. Imputation, it speaks of what we're credited. The righteousness we're judged by before the Holy God is all Jesus. Do you realize that? You're not like adding to what he puts on the table when you stand before God. Not, not when it comes to justification. You are desperate for all of Christ. The veil or the clothing that God sees on us is Jesus. His righteousness. Understand, His righteousness is not like infused into you or con- combined with your performance. No, it's imputed. It's laid upon. It's credited to us. When you stand before God in judgment, you stand wholly dependent on Jesus for all of it. If not, then you have something to say, oh yeah, and here's what I brought to the table. You got none of that. None of that that stands before the holiness of God. While we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. This is the good news. Romans 5.10 If you can hear my voice, see your sin, see your condemnation before the Holy God, see your need for a Savior, turn from that sin and trust your life to Jesus to be saved. It's the only way for salvation. It's the only power to make war with your depravity, make war with your habits for addiction or your your self-righteousness or all the stuff that plagues you. You need Jesus to go to work. You need Jesus to stand before the Holy God and be saved. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He Quickened, he resurrected us, he gave us new birth. The sovereignty of God and salvation. This is, church, the historic Orthodox Christian understanding of how God saves. Of the theology of the Christian church, going all the way back to Christ, held up by the reformers, and our precious historic confessions all stand in unity on this point. A more synergistic view of God and man combined to work out salvation only became wildly popular in the last few hundred years. And popular has become, sadly, most modern churches you walk into teach that kind of gospel. And it is not gospel. It is is a shared glory. It is the thought that somehow you bring something to the table. This is not what Scripture teaches. We're desperate for all of Christ, for Christ alone. But praise God, there's a modern-day Reformation happening in many, and in many churches, including our own. Our own church's story is to turn unto these historic truths from many years teaching something else. To, to, to link arms with our long dead and gone brothers and sisters of old, the old historic Baptist confessions, to go to our, our best roots, our most biblically grounded roots. And it is our joy to join with those who hold high these biblical truths to boast in nothing but Christ alone. And the amazing grace of God for salvation. He is due all the credit Paul is going to make this point again and again and again in the coming words of this passage. You're going to get tired of me saying it in the next weeks of preaching this passage because he wants us to see it so clearly and rejoice in it. King David said it well in the Psalms. Psalm 3.8, salvation belongs to the Lord. Psalm 62.1, for God alone my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. I often like to tell brothers and sisters, stop telling your testimony the day you accepted Jesus or the day you gave your life to God. That's way too much of a testimony about you. Start telling people the day that God saved you. 
All glory be to Christ. Did you believe? Yes. You believe because of God. The gift of faith, even Scripture says, is a gift. Did someone believe for you? No. You believed. God gave you that. All glory be to Christ. That you have faith. <laughs> All glory be to Christ. Isaiah 43, 11, He says, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. James 1.18, of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. John chapter 1, 12-13, great clarity in the early moments of John's Gospel. To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, to who belongs the credit for that? He gave the right to become children of God. To those He gave the right to become children of God. Those who are saved. Those who believe in, in Him for salvation. How did that happen? Who were born, new birth, spiritual birth, not of blood, meaning not of their family heritage. It didn't matter whose family they were in. Not of the will of the flesh or the will of man. It's not that these people finally figured it out. They finally made a choice. They finally got their head straight. Not our own will. Not our own flesh's desire. Who's the credit given? But of God. They're born of God. They believe because of God. The mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It's enslaved to sin. It needs to be quickened. It needs to be given new birth. It is the Spirit who gives life. John 6, 63 says the flesh is no help at all. John 3, 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus in this very clear moment, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can come to church for a long time. You can belong to some rad religious family heritage. You can do a lot of really great things. You could be like Nicodemus and be really, really smart and really accomplished. You are desperate to be born again by the sovereign work and will of God. And without that, there is no salvation. The deaf cannot hear, the blind cannot see, the spiritually dead cannot believe or exercise faith. New birth is required. So see with me the beauty of what Paul is declaring. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. This is why we sing. This is why we rejoice. This gift of grace, this thing we did not earn and deserve, this work of God to save us. This is... Church, this is why you're given today. And if you're given tomorrow, it's why you're given tomorrow. To, 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 to get up and to go share that with the world. To, to share with people how, that God has saved you. And, and see His grace and see His mercy. That we're dependent on Christ alone. There's no salvation apart from Jesus. <laughs> I love the visual work of God in the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the last miracle of Christ before he goes to the cross. His good friend, Lazarus, one of the many Lazaruses that we see in Scripture, had died. He's dazed in the grave. He, he really stinks. He's really rotten by now. He's bad. He's, he's dead, 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 dead. Not hours dead, not... He's dead. And in John eleven forty three, 43, it says, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
this moment. Lazarus, come out as a beautiful, visual, audible portrayal of the work of God on every person he calls from the grave in sin to new life in Christ. The effectual call of God on a dead man's life that brings about new life. A spiritually dead person made spiritually alive. The gospel is preached to the world and it all the time falls on deaf ears until God, or if and when God, by His sovereign will and work, makes that gospel call effectual for that individual. He makes it work on that person. He gives them eyes to see and ears to hear. He applies new birth to that individual. Jesus said in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. The proclamation of Jesus. Lazarus, come out, is this visual display of what God does in each of his elect when he makes his call on them irresistible. Do you realize it's irresistible? The reformers of old have always referred to it as irresistible grace. Why, why is it referred to as that? Because no one whom God calls, no one whom God gives eyes to see their depravity and what they're owed by the holy god no one who he gives ears to hear that gospel news on that day that he ordains hears god's effectual call to be born again to be quickened with spiritual faith no one says uh no thank you i'll stay in here roll the stone back over the hole i'm going to stay in here and rot in judgment for eternity. No. And I would say bigger than the motivation to not be in judgment for eternity is the beauty and the longing to finally have see, eyes to see and savor God in a way you never did when you were enslaved in sin. And you want God. All you want is Him. Amen? And that's the journey. That, that's the sanctification before us, church. We see the beauty of salvation we see the depth of grace and the work of god in his sovereign will all glory to christ and it changes us <laughs> john eleven forty four. the man who had died came out his hands and feet were bound with linen strips his face wrapped with cloth jesus said unbind him and let him go can, can, no no day on earth was the same for him can you imagine you should, because no day on earth should be the same for us. That's the point. The miracle, the power of God to take what is dead and rotting and bring it new life is amazing. That's why we praise Him. That's why we rejoice. It's the good news that what was dead is now alive. What was bound is set free. What was enslaved to sin and the enemy and what is temporary is now enslaved to Christ to serve and glorify his name now and forevermore. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What is dead must be made alive. And God does this in each one he saves. Colossians 2.12 having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. We are now in Christ. His death for our sin, his victory from the grave are now our death from sin and our victory from the grave. He's delivered us, Colossians 1:13 and 14, from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, that you are forgiven in Christ. You are made new. You have a new identity. What was dead is now alive. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen? This is us who are alive in Christ. This is good news to rejoice in and to proclaim. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Those six other words that belong to 
verse 5 is very much of its own sermon, so you've got to come back next week. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this good news. We thank you for the clarity of your word to, uh, to unstick us. Lord, we're so guilty of getting stuck in the rhythm of temporary things and temporary worries, and we miss the rejoicing that comes with this gospel truth every day, all day, that it just would put a bounce into us. It gives us a faith to endure the storms, and, and it gives us a purpose to our days and making disciples and testifying this gospel to those you put in our path. We rejoice in this good news. We, we celebrate you, the holy God, full of grace and mercy, And we pray for those that you intend to save, that they would repent and believe and be alive in Christ. We rejoice in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mighty name we pray. Amen.